Without a literal understanding of the Bible, modern science may not have arisen at all. And that's so opposite from the Dawkins of the world who say the Bible is anti-science, and yet Peter Harrison says it was thanks to understanding of the Bible that we got modern science in the first place. Therefore, to avoid science degenerating into evil and fraud, we need to recover the roots of science. If Christianity was so foundational to science, why has science flourished so much in a post-Christian world? Science is amazing, but where did it get its start? For a long time, it stagnated with little progress being made. So why was the Christian worldview so instrumental in the development of science? Dr. Sarfati, you're a PhD scientist mm -hmm. who has spent a lot of time examining the origins of science and logic. So to start off, can you tell us what assumptions are needed for science to work? Well, I mean, science requires a lot of different assumptions. I mean, for instance, you have to have objective reality. But there are some philosophies around that deny objective reality. Some of the New Age ideas thinks that the universe is one big illusion. Your postmodernism at a lot of universities denies objective truth. Uh, but you have to have a, a universe where, I mean, the law of gravity works whether you believe it exists or not. You're going to fall off a cliff regardless of what your own beliefs are. So objective reality, but also an orderly universe. For instance, uh, water boils at 100 degrees. Well, in this country it boils at 212. It's very strange. <laughs> uh, but the point is it's not going to boil at 312 tomorrow. We have um, a regular, uh, repeatable um, universe. But the thing is, what philosophy leads to that? Only the Christian idea of a divine lawmaker who's a god of order, not the author of confusion, is faithful to keep his promises. Um, that's why we should expect an orderly universe. But imagine if the Greek gods of Zeus and his gang were in charge. Well, every god has his own domain. The gods are capricious. They could change their rules at any moment. Or if the universe is one big thought, that thought could change its mind at any moment. And also atheists how do you go from there is no God to the universe is orderly? You can't get that from atheism. You have to get it from somewhere else. It doesn't. It's not provided by atheism, but only the Christian worldview provides an orderly universe. And another major point is that God gave us dominion over creation. And that means that to have proper dominion, you have to find out how it works. How does God regularly uphold his creation by what we would call natural laws? Okay. And also God was free to create how he pleased. So if he hasn't said something in the Bible about what he did, we have to find out how he did. He, God was not obliged to follow Aristotle's laws. He could create however he pleased. Kind of piggybacking off of that, what culture led science to flourish? Well, it's interesting how it was the Middle Ages that are wrongly called the Dark Ages that first led the foundation for science. In fact, uh, the Middle Ages were a period of great innovation in lots of different areas. I mean, some of our audience are wearing a Dark Ages invention called spectacles. They were invented in the 13th century, okay? And you had the blast furnace, you have the mechanical clock with the escapement, uh, you have the amazing Gothic cathedral cathedrals, which are genius works of architecture. You have the agricultural innovations like the heavy plow, so the Middle Ages supported a population three times what the Roman Empire could support. Um, and you have advances in art and logic, uh, whole genres of literature like the Canterbury Tales of uh, Chaucer. Um, but the point is they also invented the universities. That's was one of the places where science arose, but it, they also had a class called, which could be called for theologian, natural philosophers, and natural philosophy was a precursor to what we now call science. And so those are preconditions set in the Middle Ages, and they made quite amazing advances over the classical Greco-Roman world. So with regard to these early scientists, Tell us about them. What did they believe? Well, a lot of them were building on the Middle Ages, but even in the Middle Ages, you had people talking quite seriously about rotating Earth and the idea of impetus, uh, which was against what Aristotle had taught. Uh, but then you have... Um, most of the founders of modern science were believers in creation, biblical creation. You think of uh, Sir Robert Boyle, um, who is a great advances in, in chemistry, but he also wrote about defending Christianity. Um, you have um, Kepler, father of the elliptical orbits and astronomy. He said he was thinking God's thoughts after him. Uh, Sir Isaac Newton, uh, maybe the greatest scientist of all time, he actually wrote more about theology than about science. Okay, And he said this most important work uh, was a commentary on the book of Daniel. Okay. 
more than his scientific works. And you have people like Blaise Pascal, founder of hydraulics and probability. Uh, and then even later on, you have people like Faraday, who would be called a fundamentalist today if he was alive, the father of electromagnetism and electrochemistry. Then you have James Clark Maxwell, the father of maybe electromagnetism in general, a lot of thermodynamics, one of Einstein's heroes. In fact, Einstein basically built on Maxwell's equations. And Maxwell was a contemporary of Darwin and was still a biblical creationist who believed in a global flood. So uh, you can think of founders of science and just about all of them uh, were biblical creations. Think of all the laws named after science, the units named after, um, after scientists. Most of those people were biblical creationists. Got it. Going back to what you were talking about with regard to the fall of the Western Roman Empire, mm -hmm. we've talked a little bit about the preservation of knowledge after the end of classical antiquity. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit more about that. Well, the, the thing is, they could have been lost because of the disruption, and a lot of things were lost. But um, uh, as I say, the the ones which are preserved, you owe a Christian monk who basically copied, preserved, and then copied, made copies of these things. And that's how we know of a lot of classical literature, because the Christian monks were preserving it. They preserved things they didn't agree with. So some of the sort of more risque uh, plays were preserved thanks to Christians copying them. Uh, they didn't agree with Aristotle on a lot of things, like Aristotle believed the universe is eternal, but they still copied his work because they thought it was still important, worth discussing. And in the Middle Ages, they had things like uh, what's called quad libita in the university, which means anything you like. So they could discuss hmm. anything they like, and students and masters would earn their reputation by arguing a point well, even if it's a point they didn't believe in, a point that was ridiculous. If they argued it well, they would gain a reputation. So they could question um, established a science back in the Middle Ages. That kind of brings me to my next question, which is there's this view – that the church during the Middle Ages was very much opposed to science, but it sounds like you're saying the opposite. Oh, absolutely the opposite. I mean, uh, as I say, uh, people like uh, Buridan, who was actually a clergyman, uh, he actually proposed what would happen if the earth was rotating. He was able to discuss that without any repercussions. And it turns out that he actually answered a lot of arguments that were thrown against Galileo hundreds of years later. Hmm. He'd already dealt with all of the arguments. And his student, Nicole Oraim, who is a bishop in good standing, um, developed um, this idea of a rotating Earth even further. And you have people like the Merton calculators in Oxford, 14th century, who actually, um, they discovered what's called a mean speed theorem, which Galileo later developed and used the same sort of graphical proof um, that Oraim developed. Okay, so they were thinking and advancing technology, um, optics, um, and as a mechanical clock was a vital thing with an escapement. I mean, so you've got tick-tock, tick-tock, that's escapement. That mm -hmm. was a Middle Ages invention. So okay. a lot of these things that we think um, we take for granted, they actually owe their beginnings to the Middle Ages. Even soap is a Middle Ages invention. They like to, they, Middle Ages people, they like to wash, they like to bathe. Huh. Inventors soap, they had re recipes for toothpaste and mouthwash. Okay, they had pretty good teeth. And that goes against yeah. the narrative that we often that we often hear about the Middle Ages. Oh, they're dark and stinky and all that. <laughs> it's, it's total revisionism. That that's, uh, owes it to certain people in the so-called Renaissance who basically dismissed the Middle Ages and wanted to go back to classical Greco-Roman time, uh, you know, with all the slaves mm. and the mass conquests and, and annihilations of enemy people. Um, medieval serfs had rights that the Greco-Roman slaves could only dream about. Right, yeah, and so. those rights, correct me if I'm wrong, but those rights, at least in part, came from a biblical worldview, correct? That's exactly what happened, yeah. Uh, and that's why slavery was basically non-existent in the European Middle Ages. That's really interesting. Well, you, you mentioned Galileo a mm. little bit, and Galileo is often brought up as really the classic example of religion versus science. Do you have anything to say about that? Well, see, Galileo is really science versus science. That's an important thing to, to talk about. Uh, Galileo is going against the established science of his day. When you think of, see, Aristotle cosmology was still the dominant paradigm in those days. He was so highly regarded. He was just called the philosopher. That's how impressed people were by Aristotle. And the astronomy was basically Ptolemy's view, which he published in a book called The Mathematical Synt Syntaxis. 
But that became an Arabic that was called the Almagest, which means the greatest. Okay. So you get an idea of how, how much esteem these people were held. And for Galileo to challenge these people, that was going against the scientific establishment of their day. So in fact, the church actually relied on the best science that Galileo was contradicting. See, Galileo had no proof the earth moved. It doesn't seem mm -hmm. that obvious. I mean, I challenge anyone in the audience to tr prove the earth moves by using information available around 1633 and the instruments available at that time. I don't think you could do it. Right. But in fact, the church didn't really care about people proposing this as a hypothesis. They didn't care about Buridan and Oraim hundreds of years before. They didn't really give Copernicus a hard time. In fact, the Pope and his uh, high up people in the church encouraged Copernicus to, pro to propose his ideas. The Pope even um, encouraged Galileo to publish. They didn't have a problem, but the problem arose when Galileo decided to tell them how to interpret scripture. Hmm. Now, this was during the Counter-Reformation, and, and one thing about the Protestants, which we would agree with, is the right so that we can read the Scripture for ourselves without the Church telling us what to, what it means. But the, the Catholic Church didn't believe that. So, in fact, Galileo was challenging the Catholic Church by telling them how to interpret Scripture. So it's not really relevant whether we think he was right or not. I think he probably was. But that was a big problem, telling them how to do it, and um, stepping on their rightful toes as they saw it. And also, he was told to present his view as a hypothesis and discuss it, not as proven fact. It was not proven fact, mm -hmm. uh, but he disobeyed that papal injunction. And there's a possibility he actually made fun of the Pope. I mean, I'm not. this is a bit de debatable, okay, but he wrote a dialogue between... The, his view and the geocentrism, Earth stationary view. And the guy representing geocentrism was a character called Simplicio, mm -hmm. which means the fool. And <laughs> the Pope actually recognized one of his arguments in the mouth of the fool. Uh-oh. And so Galileo became, went, went from a very close friend of the Pope to a, a, a bitter enemy. And that was what the Inquisition was mainly about. He had disobeyed the, uh, his promise and they could prove he disobeyed it. Now, he was never in danger of torture. Mm -hmm. Okay. The Inquisition had very strict standards about torture, much better than the secular world at the time. No old people, no sick people. Galileo was both. He was in his 60s and not in the best of health. Uh, so no danger of torture, no danger of capital punishment. And his sentence was being house arrested in a luxury villa where he had assistants who could help him produce the best scientific work of his career. Okay. Now that's really interesting. Yeah. So I guess the question is, if Christianity was so foundational to science, why has science flourished so much in a post-Christian world? Well, you see, Christianity is so good that we people can live off its capital for many generations, okay? We're still benefiting from a lot of the Christian capital, uh, not just scientifically, but morally as well. I mean, the fact that we think slavery is unthinkable, that goes back to the Christian like, like Gregory of Nyssa, who basically rebutes benevolent slave owners saying, well, mm -hmm. how dare you think that you can own a man made in God's image? Okay, so that's one thing. Uh, equality of women, that was unknown in the Greco-Roman world. Uh, rights of children uh, to live and not be disposed, left on the hillside to die, infanticide, rife in the Greco-Roman world, but also the idea of science. The, we still believe the universe is orderly. We mm -hmm. still think we have a right, we, we should be investigating to find out how the universe works. Those things are still there, but they're really Christian things that we take for granted and have forgotten they, they're Christian things. And atheist scientists are still using that Christian capital, but I wonder how much longer that can work because without morality behind it, science can be used for, for great evil as well. Mm -hmm. Nazi Germany worked out wonderful scientific ways of exterminating Jews, okay, so, so that's an evil use of science. And eugenics, uh, very much part of, of evolutionary history in Germany and in America, sad to say, right. okay. And also, there's a large epidemic of scientific fraud. That's become a huge problem because if you haven't got the morality to produce honesty, don't bear false witness and the truth shall set you free. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. Okay. Without those, well, why not commit fraud if you get away with it? So we do hear a lot of people making the claim that Christianity 
is opposed to science and historically has always pretty much been opposed to science. What do you say to that? Well, see, that began, there was a couple of books in the 19th century. You have uh, John Draper, and then 20 years later, you have um, Andrew Dixon White, the founder of Cornell University. Both wrote books, very big books, uh, basically about the warfare between science and Christendom. Hmm. Now, most historians today laugh at those books. They're so bad. They're so, it makes so, so many false, utterly false claims, even though White's book has a, blu- has a lot of citation bluffing. It is all bluff when you check them out, okay? That's where a lot of the, the, the warfare thesis began with those two men. They're still widely regarded in many circles, but I mean, historians of science just think that it's garbage and use it as an example of how not to do history. So that's where a lot of those myths became uh, began was, was those two guys. And when you look into the history of the church, a lot of it has been very supportive. The church was basically founded the university system, which is where science first developed. So it's quite the opposite. And we can go into a few specific claims that people have as well. Certainly, yeah. I mean, for instance, does the Bible teach a flat earth? Well, absolutely it does, does not. In fact, no one, almost no one in the church believed in a flat earth. In fact, you've got the greatest uh, theologian, like, like the Venerable Bede, who taught a round earth, you know, circular, not like a shield, but like a ball, okay? Mm. Uh, and that's sort of 800 years before Columbus went around. Uh, Thomas Aquinas in the high Middle Ages, the greatest theologian of the time, he uh, thought the round earth was so obvious that was used as an example of something which is really obvious and well-known. Okay. Now, what about um, does the Bible teach geocentrism? Well, I think no more than we do when we talk about the sun rising and setting. We say that today. Um, We see a stop sign. We stop. But what does it mean? The earth is rotating? How can we stop if the earth is rotating? That means the stop sign is relative to the ground. Hmm. And the Bible uses the same sort of language relative to the ground. And in in physics, you can choose whatever reference frame you like, okay? Uh, Your car's GPS uses your car as a reference frame. You see all the streets moving around you, but you're the reference frame there. And even the Bible sometimes uses other things as the reference frame. Like if you look at Acts 27, 27, and if you had to go into the Greek, there's a particular construction. If you want the fancy term, it's called the accusative plus infinitive construction. Okay, and if you translate that properly, it says uh, the sailors sense that some land were drawing close to them. And if you go back to the um, the classical literature like Virgil, uh, he said, as we set out from on the sea, the land and the city receded. So again, classical literature plus the Bible had the ship as your reference frame, a nautico-centric reference frame. Now, if you want to send satellites to the planets and outside the solar system, you should use the sun as your reference frame, okay? And it makes the maths far simpler if you're talking about the whole solar system to use the sun, or in fact, to be precise, it's the center of mass of the solar system that you use. But there's no, it's not a mistake to have the Earth as a reference frame. It's only a matter of transformation of coordinates. So that we're not make, it's not a mistake uh, to, 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 for the Bible to talk about sunrise or sunset any more than it is for us to do the same. Right. And nobody would ever say that the earth that the uh, the Bible rather is promoting this idea that there's a ship at the center of the universe and the mm-hmm. earth moves around it. Well, you also got a passage in the Psalms, okay, which says the earth shall not move, but also says, I shall not move. Hmm. Okay, same same Hebrew verb there, but no one says the, the psalmist is in a, is a straitjacket and is the center <laughs> of the universe. Uh, okay, so the, so the Bible isn't teaching geocentrism. Right. Okay. There are various other accusations I could go into if you want. Now, Certainly. Now, for instance, did the church ban human dissection? Well, answer no. The pagans, Greco-Roman pagans banned human dissection, okay? Okay. It was the medieval church that lifted the ban on dissection. And it was thanks to that lifting of the ban that people like Vesalius could um, really make huge advances into studying human anatomy. Okay, that's another myth. Oh, where's another one? Um, how about childbirth pain relief, anesthesia? Now, in the 19th century, James Simpson developed chloroform and advocated it for pain relief. Now, he tried to ward off possible Christian objections. 
because God said to the woman, Eve, uh, but because you sinned, you're going to have childbirth pain and so will your descendants. That's what's implied there. Also, how dare you interfere with God's plan? Uh, so, so Simpson tried to ward that off by saying, well, God, you put Adam to sleep to make Eve from his rib. Therefore, he used anesthesia. Hmm. And we could also point out that Jesus' healing miracles on earth alleviated uh, aspects of the curse, curing diseases and blindness and dumbness and deafness and lameness uh, was all alleviating aspects of the curse. And there, and he sent an example for us to do the same. Okay, so, right. But as it turned out, no Christian of note made the subjection. The Christians were actually fairly were very supportive of pain relief. Okay, I mean, for instance, this is sort of um, the industrial revolution was in full swing. Lots of inventions. Okay, and they realized, well, okay, God said to Adam, "You're going to um, um, eat by painful toil, sweat of your brow." But no one objected to labor-saving advices that alleviated that part of it. Right. So you may as well think, well, if, if Chloroform is, is forbidden by the Bible, and so are labor-saving devices forbidden, okay? So you can't have it both ways. So the Christian objections were not there. There were some scientific objections. I mean, chloroform is an untested substance. Maybe it's not safe. Hmm. And in fact, we would say it's not safe. It's hardly ever used today, okay? But that's about the means of anesthesia and not the principle. Another objection was sort of a moral objection. You put the woman to sleep, she's like drunkenness and therefore can't, um, f her mind isn't functioning. She can't follow ob objections. So, but this is not a biblical objection. It's sort of a medical and moral objection. Right. But they soon died. They, those, they, they soon disappeared. I mean, but there weren't really any Christian objections. So despite the fact that Simpson anticipated them, he never had to use them. Right. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but Simpson was a biblical creationist. Oh, he, he very much so. Yeah. Uh, just like all the founders of modern science, yeah, Simpson was yet another one. Right. So was uh, people like um, Joseph Lister, who founded antiseptic surgery. And you have uh, people like Pasteur, the germ theory of disease, was a Catholic creationist. Mm -hmm. I mean, and these guys lived around the same time as Darwin, and they didn't, they weren't convinced by Darwinism. That's interesting. Well, so in looking back over a lot of what we've talked thus far, we, we've seen pretty clearly how so much of what we take for granted in the scientific world depends directly on the assumptions given by the Christian worldview. Correct. And much of this has been forgotten now, though. Well, the medieval time has a very um, bad reputation, which is quite undeserved. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, there were shortcomings in the Middle Ages for sure. I mean, but the thing is, they were quite rational. I mean, for instance, the witch crazes, that was the Renaissance and even the basically the so-called Enlightenment, which you normally call the early modern period if you're not trying to be judgmental one way or the other. The mm -hmm. early modern period. Think of the witch trials of Salem, six, uh, 1692 to 3. That's not Middle Ages. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the idea, the church position in the Middle Ages that, is that witchcraft didn't exist. Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah, uh, but in the Renaissance, they were much more superstitious uh, hundreds of years later, so they thought witchcraft um, did exist. But interestingly enough, the Inquisition basically was more rational and actually rejected a lot of the, the witch charges. So in fact, there was less witch burning where the Inquisition was stronger. Okay, that's another thing you won't hear. Uh, but there was some superstition. I, I admit some of the um, things like relics, I mean, enough pieces of the of the cross to, mm -hmm. to build an ark, probably. That's, that's, that's what one of the jokes uh, they had there. Um, but also there was a tendency to allegorize scripture. Now, the Reformation made a very important stride because the Reformation really recovered a more literal and objective understanding of the Bible. Okay. Okay, what does the text actually mean? That's what we would believe too, right? Uh, that the Bible has an objective meaning, and we're supposed to believe what the objective meaning is rather than try to tell God what he really meant to say. Okay? That's right, yeah. And allegorize. And uh, after the Reformation, many scientists transferred this objective, uh, sort of straightforward view of scripture to their workings of nature instead of well maybe nature has to behave because aristotle said it behaves this way well we've got to actually see what nature actually does so that actually led to quite a, a big advance in science and you have a, an australian historian of science called peter harrison who wrote a book about it and he, he says without a literal understanding of the bible modern science may not have arisen at all hmm 
And that's such so opposite from the Dawkins of the world who say the Bible is anti-science and all that. And yet Peter Harrison says it was thanks to the uh, a literal, you know, fundamentalist understanding of the Bible that we got modern science in the first place. Right. Well, and um, it is ironic too that not too long ago, at the time of this recording, we do mm-hmm. have uh, Richard Dawkins talking about the benefits of. Christianity as a whole at, on on society, and I believe um, we were talking before we rolled the cameras about um, how Margaret Thatcher talked about some some stuff like that. Well, it's, it's, and Richard Dawkins has been doing this for a few years now. Actually, we've got a quote on our website going back a few years, basically saying no Christian suicide bombers, and by getting rid of Christianity, we may have been removed, moving a bulwark against something much worse. Okay, so he, he's been calling himself a cultural Christian for some time. Okay, mm-hmm. and essentially, Margaret Thatcher also talked about um, the importance of of, Christ, of of the fruits of Christianity, but you can't really keep those fruits unless you nurture those roots. Hmm. But she also said that uh, we um, don't believe in Christianity because of the great fruits, but, but because it's true and it's basically God's answer to the problem of sin. That's the, the real reason we believe in Christianity. But another thing I want to get back to is another advance made possible – in science goes to the later times of Francis Bacon, a very famous um, uh, scientist and philosopher of science. And Peter Harrison wrote another book, which is about the fall of man and the importance to Bacon's scientific work. Because Bacon believed, well, but but we believe that fall a literal fall of a literal atom brought the loss of innocence and, and uh, lost his sinless. He became a sinner, uh, okay, right. and all his descendants are sinners. But Bacon thought that he also had encyclopedic knowledge um, before the fall, and that was lost at the fall. And the, the purpose of the scientists was to try to rediscover the pre-fall knowledge that they believe Adam must have had. So they clearly believed in a literal Adam and a literal fall, and this was foundational to their scientific projects. Dr. Sarfati, this is a huge amount of information in a very short amount of time. What's the takeaway for Christians? Well, Christians shouldn't be afraid of science. In fact, we should reclaim science because it was a scientific um, world, the Christian worldview that led to modern science. But also historically, most of the founders of modern science were pretty devout Christian creationists. And therefore, uh, to avoid science degenerating into evil and fraud, we need to recover the roots of science. Hmm the Christian roots of science, but also uh, we don't believe in Christianity just because it has good fruit, but because it's true and it's a, it's a solution that, that God provided for man's sinfulness, that we can be forgiven uh, through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior who died for our sins. That's right. We believe it because we believe that the Bible is true, not just that it's it's useful or it offers us some social benefits. That's exactly right, yes. So what are some resources that you recommend for further reading? Well, I wrote a, a pair of articles, companion articles, and one of them is creation.com slash why science, which goes through the biblical assumptions that were logically and historically required for science to function. And the companion article is creation.com slash roots, the Christian roots of science, uh, which is about about a historical survey of how science developed starting from the medieval times through to the advances made in the Reformation and then the advances made because of trying to recover Adam's pre-fall knowledge. And we'll make both of those articles available in the description below. Dr. Sarfati, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for taking the time. Well, thank you, Sheridan. 